and we will begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And get I so good to see you. As today we look at Psalm 27 and see what it has to inspire us as we head into a new year. As David begins with this brilliant thesis statement declaring what his relationship with God looks like. And then he clearly explains some of his life experiences that back up why his relationship with God is for real. And then David finishes with a couple of bold declarations affirming his original thesis statement. And so, without further ado, let's open our Bibles and look at David's bold claim that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I reckon that is a far better mantra to carry you into a new year than any of our personal goal attainment resolutions or even any promise to increase our spiritual well-being which are great resolutions to increase your head knowledge and understanding of God but because they are about doing things, they can miss the heart attachment and become things you have to do because you are a Christian, leading you to think of them as a chore. It kind of becomes like doing the dishes because you are part of the family. And so our resolve becomes the statistics that media loves to tell us how around 80% of us will have ditched our New Year's resolutions by February. Whereas I reckon God would like us to be looking at having a heart that treasures who or what God is in your life so that we can truly image him to the world around us. And David's positive affirmation is something that anyone and everyone can have to help you go into another year and face the unknown future. Although I'm not sure why we think clicking over into a new year makes the future more unknown than waking up to a brand new day. For while we can know with reasonable certainty what we are doing in the day, there are many variables outside our control that can turn our perfectly planned day upside down. Anything from minor irritants to something major that turns your world upside down. And while they usually don't all happen in one day, but there will be days where you feel like the rug has been pulled out from under your feet and you are left floundering in the darkness of unanswerable questions like why? Oh, why did this happen? If only I had. What did I do to deserve this? Whereas Psalm 27 shows us that even before those awful things happen, if we start each day by firstly focusing on how the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Remember, God is light means God is everything that is pure and good. God's light drives out the darkness of our thoughts, giving us the light of the knowledge of him through Jesus to help us image him. And Isaiah, who would have known this psalm, in chapter 58, verse 7, gives a good example of the way we are to image God by sharing your food with the hungry, to bring the poor into your home, to clothe the naked, and don't turn your back on your own flesh and blood when they are down on their luck. And then the interesting thing is that verses 8 and 9, Isaiah then speaks back into this psalm as he tells God's people that by doing these things, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. In imaging God, the light of God will light up our lives and bring healing. 
not the physical healing we tend to think of, instead the healing of our relationship with God. And unlike David, looking to the future for God's salvation, we modern people can look at the past and know how through Jesus' death and resurrection, we have the awesome gift of salvation. Our sins are gone and God's light cannot expose them because I have put my faith and trust in Jesus, who is my Lord, my light and my salvation. And therefore, I don't need to be afraid of God. And secondly, as verse 1 finishes with, we should also be reminding ourselves how the Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Now, your Bible may say refuge or fortress instead of stronghold, because in Hebrew, stronghold conveys the meaning of a strong, fortified place you can take refuge in, where you will be protected from the enemy. And while we Aussie Christians aren't facing being hunted like a criminal, as David was, we too face an enemy who, as the Apostle Peter, in his first letter, chapter 5, verse 8, explains, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And if we take David's advice, we will find he's right. It's even better when we hide ourselves in God. And so you can start the day knowing people who are making your life miserable are not the enemy. No, the real enemy is Satan. And if, like David, we make God our stronghold, then we have the ultimate protection. For we can go, rack off Satan, you and your mates, you ain't got what it takes. For God is my stronghold and he will protect me from you. And Satan has no choice but to go. And then in verses 2, 3, 10 and 12, we find David proving his thesis statement by describing some of his experiences where he took refuge in God's protection. First, verses 2 and 3. When evildoers advanced against me to devour me, my enemies and foes stumbled and fell. Though an army besieged me, my heart is not afraid. Though war breaks out against me, still I am confident. Now, as we know, David's nemesis was King Saul, who instead of protecting Israel from the enemies wanting to conquer them, he had brought out his whole army to destroy David. And perhaps one day in the future, we Aussies may wake up like the Ukrainians did and find ourselves in the middle of a war. But until that day, the first verse is still relevant to us modern people. For nowadays, Christians are seen as the bigoted enemy, wanting to spoil people's self-indulgent fun that sooner or later leads to the darkness of regrets over actions taken or words spoken. Now, did you notice how David hasn't gone on the offensive by attacking the enemy? No, he realises that there is a bigger issue than the enemy attacking you. The real enemy and warfare are spiritual. David knows that the big issue boils down to what is happening in his heart. Who does your heart treasure? For that is the one you are going to trust to stop these attacks. Will you trust yourself to solve the problem and take matters into your own hands? Or, as David tells us, will you put your trust in God to be your stronghold? For when we do, my heart is not afraid. I can be confident. And then, in verse 12, David takes his antagonists from the anonymous society at large bringing the enemy closer to home. As he says, Do not turn me over to my enemies, for false witnesses breathing violence testify against me. Even us modern people, at some point or another, if you have lived long enough, will have experienced the awful turmoil when a friend or workmate starts spreading lies about you or becomes emotionally and or verbally abusive towards you, leaving you anxious about why your friendship has soured 
or worried about your job security. And here, the spiritual battle, who is going to rule the heart, the darkness of fear and anxiety, or the light of God giving me confidence to say, like David does in verse 5, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. And this doesn't mean David is saying, God is going to wave a magic wand and take away the lies and abuse. Just look at how many times King Saul wanted David dead. And did you notice how David doesn't go on the attack, nor does he argue against their false accusations? David wants people to know the enemy can lie and cheat and rage away. But when they do, you need to go to God, praying, verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. And God will teach you to protect your heart from the darkness of their emotional harm by taking the straight path towards hiding yourself in the safety of his loving arms, where you will experience his loving light shining in your heart as God sets you high on a rock-solid foundation. And then in verse 10, David brings the enemy right into the home as he explains how, even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will care for me. And firstly, this does not mean David's parents had abandoned him. Rather, he is giving the worst case personal scenario to show that even if the unthinkable happens and his parents abandon him, and some of you will have experienced the dreadful, heart-wrenching hurt of parents rejecting you, and for those of us modern people who have great parents, instead, some of us will have experienced the devastating heartbreak of a husband, boyfriend, or wife, girlfriend's betrayal, leaving you second-guessing as to what has happened for it to go so wrong. And once again, David knows this is a huge spiritual battle to decide who will he put his hope and trust in. Will he put his trust in the love of his parents or family? No, for David knows that his trust in his family comes second to the sure confidence he has that the Lord will care for me. And David's rock-solid faith in God comes from prayers in verses 7 to 9, asking God to... Hear my voice when I call. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me. O oh God, my saviour. And here we see how David's greatest heart desire is not the feeling of comfort and safety that comes from a family's love. Nor does David want God to mollycoddle him by sending his enemies packing or to pay back his abusive, lying, so-called friends. No, David's ultimate desire is for his heart to be continually seeking God's face to not have God reject him and turn away in anger from him because he has stopped loving God. How it is only God who can truly help him in any dire situation he finds himself in. David knows that in the grand scheme of life how vitally important it is to have a heart that treasures God above everything else. And that is why he prays in verse 4, 4. One thing I desire most that I ask of the Lord is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Now what we modern people need to remember is that at this point in time, the temple was a tent, admittedly a pretty large impressive tent. But David wasn't going to look at the impressive workmanship that Exodus chapters 36 and 37 describes with its blue 
purple and scarlet curtains of finely twisted linen with cherubim worked into them. Oh, the golden lampstands and the altar plus all the other items and utensils. No, David wanted to experience what Moses had in Exodus chapter 33 verse 11. Where? The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And here, face to face is more than really getting to know God like you do a friend. It is about desiring to know all of God's attributes and characteristics and wisdom and power to really gaze at God until you understand just how mighty of a God he is. And David knew that what our eyes longingly gaze at, our hearts will follow. And David's heart treasured having an intimate relationship with God. And the best place to start was the temple, where the destructions and demands of the world, the darken a person's thoughts, could be replaced by changing the focus of his mind as he longingly gazed at the beauty of God's glorious light and salvation. And with a change of focus, David declares in verse 6, how my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his temple I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Once again, David is not expecting immediate relief from his enemies. Twice he had the perfect opportunity to kill King Saul. And despite encouragement to remove his enemy once and for all, David point blank refused to. For David knew that taking the matter into his own hands would cause God to turn his face away from him. For as David told King Saul on the second occasion, which is in 1 Samuel chapter 26 verses 23 to 24, the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. David is not only looking forward to when God will bring about his kingship like he had promised all those years ago when Samuel anointed him, David is also looking forward to that future day when, as he says in Psalm 96, verses 10 and 13, the Lord reigns and he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all people in his truth. And most of us modern Christians can relate. We are living, waiting for whatever it is that God has clearly promised will happen in your life. And also looking forward to that day when Jesus will return in all his amazing glory to reign over the earth and judge all people according to whether their name is in the book of life, which was just discussed in detail just recently, so I am not going into it again here. And just like David meeting with God in church and gazing on his glorious light, our hearts should be bubbling over with joy at the incredible privilege and treasure it is to be in God's presence. And so when we sing, we should be lifting the roof with our joyful noise. And David concludes his thesis Firstly, with verse 13, showing how all of these life experiences where he has deliberately chosen to treasure God in his heart and allow God's light to overcome the darkness of his circumstances allows him to boldly proclaim, I am still confident of this. I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. And we modern people know that eventually God did fulfill his promise and David became king over Israel. But for David, there was a long wait, somewhere between 15 and 20 years from Samuel anointing him and being proclaimed king over Israel. And so this bold statement of confidence in his God was made sometime during that long, long period where if 
he had focused on his terrible circumstances and horrible enemies, it would have seemed impossible that God's word could come true. Instead, David had deliberately chosen to treasure the light of God and his salvation, making God his stronghold, and therefore he could be supremely confident that someday, goodness knows when, it will happen. And I reckon his last words to wrap up his thesis would strike a chord in most of us modern Christians as he says, Wait for the Lord, be strong and courageous. Yes, wait for the Lord. And really, at times, we seem to spend far more time waiting for the Lord to act than anything else. And I don't know about you, but when one of the promises happens, then there is another one waiting in the wings. But like David, I too discovered that in the times of waiting, I am constantly asking God to teach me his ways. And as God teaches me, my heart learns to really seek after God, to really look into his face, to really treasure my relationship with our God. And that is why I find today's psalm so encouraging. And so I am looking at making a poster to put on the fridge with the opening thesis and concluding verses to remind me constantly, I go to the fridge a lot. So during those times when it feels like life has handed me lemons, I can refocus by reminding myself that, and perhaps you would like to too. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For I am still confident of this. I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Yes, wait for the Lord. Amen.